Welcome to the Canadian edition of the Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. I love the straightforwardness and the simplicity that, that he uses to teach. His teachings are very simple for everybody to understand. If it hadn't been for this ministry, I don't know where I would be. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm beginning my fourth week of teaching on a better way to pray. This may be my last week. It just depends on how much I cover this week, but we're drawing to a close in this series. And I've got this little book that is just a brief summary of the entire teaching. I have a full book on this, and I wrote this a long time ago. This has been one of the foundational teachings that I've got, but this one is an absolutely freebie that we want to send you. We are asking for a donation for this. We have it in English and in Spanish. We also have CDs, DVDs, study guides, a USB, and even a audio book. And we'll be giving out all of that information. But I tell you, this subject of prayer, you can't have a relationship with God without prayer. And yet I think that most people's prayer life just really, really is wanting. Uh, and if you pray incorrectly, you can actually do damage instead of good things. And so I've, I've covered a lot of things. I talked about what prayer is not, and we covered a lot of religious traditions in that. Then we talked about New Testament versus Old Testament prayer, which there is a huge difference. And actually, if you are praying the way that people prayed in the Old Testament, it's actually anti-Christ. I don't mean that in a bad sense, but it's against what Christ has done. And most people aren't going through Jesus and what He's done. They are basically praying and begging God as if Jesus hadn't already come and fulfilled all of these things. Then last week, I spent the entire week trying to just talk about what prayer is. Prayer is basically primarily for relationship with God. There is a place to ask and receive. James chapter 4, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own lust, but you have not because you ask not. So there is a place to ask. There is a place to repent and to tell the Lord that you're sorry and turn from your sins. But that should, and this is just total andeology. I can't verify this, but in my estimation, you're asking and repenting and things like that ought to comprise 5% or less of your prayer life. Your prayer life ought to be primarily about just worshiping God, loving God. It says that Paul and Silas, they sang and praised God and prayed unto the Lord. Meditation is prayer. I use that verse out of Psalms chapter 5 and Psalms chapter 1 and Psalms chapter 2. Being focused on the Lord, keeping your mind stayed upon the Lord, in just your thought life and studying the Word and meditating on godly things. It's all prayer. It's all communion with God. And that ought to comprise at least 90 to 95 percent of your prayer life. Again, that's andeology. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that would vary from person to person in what situation you're in. But man, we are using prayer for all kinds of things except relationship with God. And God loves you. And God really wants to have a relationship with you. So that's what I spent last week talking about. So I want to turn over to Luke chapter 11 and read a uh, parable that Jesus gave. And this parable is used to teach things that I believe are completely opposite what prayer really should be. In the first few verses of Luke chapter 11, Jesus taught what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Most of the time it's quoted from Matthew chapter 6, but Luke recorded the same thing right here about our Father which art in heaven, and he gave that uh, teaching on prayer. And then in verse 5, he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And this is often used to say that God is like this so-called friend 
that, uh, you know, if you come and request help in the middle of the night, he's going to say, look, I'm already in bed. My wife and kids are in bed. Don't leave, uh, leave me alone. Get out of here. In other words, he's not going to be prone to answer your prayer. But if you will just keep after him, you will finally get an answer just because of your importunity. I would say that this is the way that this parable is interpreted most of the time, that God, for whatever reason, is not prone to answer your prayers quickly, and you just have to badger Him. You just have to keep after God. You have to wear Him out, wear Him down, until where He finally says, I'm going to have to answer this person's prayer. They're going to keep bugging me about this. You know, if you stop and think about it, that's a terrible thing to teach that God is like that. And yet people say, well, isn't that what this parable is teaching? No, it's just the opposite. This isn't making a comparison. It's making a contrast. Think about it this way. How many of you have a friend that if you had a need in the middle of the night and if you were to call them and wake them up in the middle of the night, how many of you have friends that would say, look, it's the middle of the night. Leave me alone. I'm not going to help you. I can imagine that there's some of you saying, yeah, I have a friend like that. Let me just suggest that those aren't really friends. That's not a friend. I can't think, I've got, you know, I've got people that are really good friends of mine, but I've got paint acquaintances and people that, you know, we aren't necessarily that close, but I can't really think of anybody that I would call a friend, that if I was to call them in the middle of the night and say, man, I need help. Could you pray with me? Could you help me? I can't think of a single friend that would turn me down just because it's inconvenient for them. And let me suggest to you that if you say, well, I've got friends like that, they aren't friends. A friend would treat you better than this. And so what the Lord is doing, He's drawing on human comparisons to say that if people who are fallen people, and even at their best, they still are a far, fallen human being. They aren't truly a good representation of God because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If people would treat you better than this, then why would you think that God Almighty, who loved you enough to send His Son and to die for you, would treat you less? He wouldn't treat you as good as a friend. That's what he's talking about, and the context proves it. If you just keep reading, the very next verse says, and I say unto you. In other words, he's making a contrast. He's not comparing himself to this friend who wouldn't give the person what they needed just because it was inconvenient. He's making a contrast, saying that if that person, if you could get uh, pe people to treat you better than this, well, then listen to what I say. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Can you see the contrast? He's not saying that he's like this friend and that you've got to just badger him. He's saying, look, if you could expect better treatment from a person like this, then how much more? If you ask me, you shall receive. If you seek, you find. If you knock, it shall be opened unto you. In verse 10, he says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And so he's, he's contrasting himself and saying, I'm telling you, I'm better than any friend that you've ever had. God loves you more than any friend. You know, I've often used this exact same logic. I remember going to a man who he was in a hospital and they didn't expect him to live through the night and he just kept hanging on and finally he lived for a week and so they sent him home to die, sent him home in an ambulance and he called me and he couldn't even hold the phone up. He was so weak. His wife held the phone up to his uh, head and I talked to him and I told him, don't you dare die until I get there. And so I went over there and I was trying to encourage him that God wanted him well. And he says, well, I'm 70 something. And he says, I've lived a good life and I'm ready to go. And he says, I'm just not sure that God wants to heal me. And you know what I did? His wife was kneeling right beside his bed. And I said, look, I said, I know that you aren't the perfect husband. And I said, there's probably times that you've upset your wife and done things to cause her to be upset with you and stuff like that. But I said, despite that, if your wife had the ability to just wave her hand and heal you, 
do you think that she would let you suffer like this and die? And this guy just, he nearly got mad, like, absolutely not. She would do anything for me. She, even though, you know, we've had things that happened between a man and his wife, says she would do anything to produce healing. And I said, and you think God Almighty loves you less than your wife? And all of a sudden, it just put everything into a perspective that he, he says, all right, I believe it's God's will to heal me. And I ministered to him. But see, that's what the Lord is doing. If you could expect better treatment than from a person, well, then how could you not expect God to answer your prayer? I'm telling you, if you ask, you receive. You seek, you find. Everyone who asks will receive. So that's what he's doing. He's not making a comparison, but he's making a contrast between this so-called friend who wouldn't give a person what they needed because it was inconvenient. And he's contrasting that with God who said, you just ask and you receive. And then he goes on and says, everyone that asks receives. Everyone that seeks finds. Everyone that knocks it shall be open." Now, let me just say, and I'm going to deal with this the rest of this week, some of you say, well, I see what he's saying, but it's obvious that I have asked for certain things and I did not get it. And so it can't mean what it looks like it says. I believe it means just exactly what it says. I believe Jesus meant this exactly. And I'm going to be explaining this. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You have to believe you receive when you pray, not when you see it. And so you have to believe that this is true, that if you ask for anything according to His will, you know that He hears you. That's 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. If we ask for anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of Him. You've got to believe that God is not like this friend in this parable, that He is much, much greater than that, that He wants to answer. If you ask, you receive. You have to believe that. And I know that sometimes it doesn't look like that, so I'm going to be dealing with that the rest of the week. But I'm just trying to point out that this is not a comparison. It's a contrast. And that's what He's doing. And then He goes on to say in verse 11, "...if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone?" Of course, the obvious answer to this is no. A parent, even if it's not a good parent, did you know even a bad parent wouldn't sit there and give a stone to their child if they asked for a piece of bread? Even if you could think of some person who would do that, this isn't a total comparison. It's a contrast saying that even lost people treat their kids better than this. Why would you expect God to treat you any less? So if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Absolutely not. Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? No. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Absolutely not. Nobody would treat their kids this way. Why do we think that our heavenly father would sit there and if you're asking for healing, no, he gives you a cancer and wants you to suffer and wants you to die with it. If you're in a financial need, God is going to tell you no and just sit there and watch you suffer under this. If people, earthly parents, would treat us better than this, why do we think that our Heavenly Father would be any worse? I tell you, this comes from people who are trying to reconcile what these verses say about ask and you receive, seek you find, knock and it shall be open, and they're trying to reconcile that with what their experience says. And their experience is that they've prayed for healing and yet they saw people die. They prayed for finances and didn't see it come to pass. And they're trying to harmonize it. And rather than sit there and say, well, some way or another, we must have missed it, religion has just come out and said, well, sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says, I'm leaving this in your life to, so that you can suffer and it's making you better. And they come up with all of these excuses. <laughs> Amen. I know that what I'm saying is ruffling a lot of people's feathers, but I'm telling you, this is what religion is great at, is making excuses for why the Word of God doesn't work. 
I WAS RAISED IN A DENOMINATION THAT ACTUALLY TAUGHT THAT GOD DOESN'T DO MIRACLES ANYMORE, THAT MIRACLES PASSED AWAY WITH THE APOSTLES AND THAT WE DON'T HAVE SUCH THINGS AS MIRACLES AND HEALINGS TODAY. AND THEY WERE MASTERS AT EXPLAINING AWAY WHY PEOPLE DIDN'T WALK IN VICTORY AND HEALTH AND THE THINGS THAT WE SEE IN THE BIBLE DIDN'T COME TO PASS TODAY. BUT THEY WERE ALL EXCUSES. NONE OF THAT STUFF IS TRUE. JESUS IS THE SAME YESTERDAY, TODAY, AND FOREVER, AND HE WANTS TO HEAL AND DELIVER AND SET FREE AND PROSPER AND BLESS US AS MUCH AS HE EVER DID IN BIBLICAL DAYS. BUT RELIGION COMES UP WITH ALL OF THESE EXCUSES. BUT THIS IS SAYING THAT IF YOU WOULD EXPECT A PARENT TO TREAT YOU GOOD, HOW MUCH MORE SHOULD YOU EXPECT GOD TO DO IT? AND YET THE AVERAGE CHRISTIAN BELIEVES THAT GOD IS DISCONNECTED AND SOMETIMES HE'LL JUST LET YOU STEW IN YOUR JUICE. HE'LL JUST LET YOU SIT THERE AND SUFFER. He's, HE DOESN'T CARE. He, HE'S NOT COMPASSIONATE ABOUT YOU. I TELL YOU, THAT IS A TOTAL WRONG IMPRESSION. AND THEY GET IT FROM THINGS JUST LIKE THIS, THINKING THAT GOD IS compar- JESUS IS COMPARING GOD THE FATHER TO A FRIEND WHO JUST WON'T GIVE YOU WHAT HE NEEDS BECAUSE IT'S INCONVENIENT FOR HIM. I TELL YOU, THAT'S NOT GOD AT ALL. GOD IS NOT SITTING THERE WITH HIS ARMS FOLDED LIKE THIS SAYING, BEG A LITTLE, BEG A LITTLE MORE. I'M DISAPPOINTED WITH YOU. YOU GOT TO GET A HUNDRED PEOPLE TO PRAY. YOU GOT TO GET THE PRAYER TEAM TO PRAY. YOU'RE GOING TO HAVE TO PUT MORE PRESSURE ON ME THAN THIS. I'M NOT PRONE TO ANSWER YOUR PRAYER. GOD'S NOT LIKE THAT. GOD'S LIKE THIS. HE'S TRYING TO GET THE BLESSING TO YOU. GOD IS TRYING TO BLESS YOU. GOD WANTS YOU TO BE BLESSED MORE THAN YOU WANT TO BE BLESSED. YOU KNOW, THERE WAS A TIME WHEN JAMIE AND I FIRST GOT STARTED, WE HAD JUST BEEN MARRIED JUST A FEW MONTHS AND THIS WAS MY OWN FAULT. IT WASN'T GOD WHO DID IT TO ME, BUT I WAS CALLED TO THE MINISTRY. AND WHEN JAMIE AND I GOT MARRIED, I JUST DETERMINED THAT I WAS GOING TO GO FULL-TIME IN THE MINISTRY. I QUIT MY JOB, AND I WAS WAITING ON GOD TO JUST, YOU KNOW, SUPPLY MONEY SUPERNATURALLY. I DIDN'T HAVE THE UNDERSTANDING THAT, uh, YOU KNOW, IF YOU DON'T WORK, YOU DON'T EAT. AND PAUL SAID THAT uh, GOD WOULD SUPPLY HIS NEED PROPORTIONAL TO HIS MINISTRY. I JUST THOUGHT I WAS SINNING AGAINST GOD IF I WORKED A SECULAR JOB BECAUSE I WAS CALLED TO THE MINISTRY. SO I QUIT MY JOB, AND JAMIE AND I NEARLY STARVED TO DEATH. AND I MEAN, JUST A COUPLE OF MONTHS AFTER WE WERE MARRIED, WE WERE FACING EVICTION. WE HADN'T EATEN FOR DAYS. AND, uh, MAN, I WAS... I DIDN'T UNDERSTAND WHAT I'M SAYING RIGHT HERE ABOUT I SHOULD HAVE BEEN WORKING. I HONESTLY THOUGHT I WAS DOING THE RIGHT THING. I THOUGHT I WAS DOING WHAT GOD TOLD ME TO DO. AND, BUT I WAS HEARTBROKEN TO SEE JAMIE GO WITHOUT FOOD. I WAS SUPPOSED TO BE PROVIDING FOR HER. AND I REMEMBER THAT uh, WE HAD A FRIEND THAT DROVE A COKE TRUCK. AND HE CAME BY AND HE JUST STOPPED TO VISIT US. AND HE BROUGHT IN A CASE OF COKES AND GAVE IT TO US. AND HE HAD A BAG OF FRITOS, ONE OF THESE LARGER BAG OF FRITOS THAT HE HAD BEEN EATING OUT OF, AND SO IT WAS HALF GONE, AND HE GAVE THAT TO US. AND THIS IS ALL JAMIE AND I HAD HAD FOR ABOUT A WEEK. WE RATIONED OUT COKES AND FRITOS, AND THAT'S ALL WE HAD EATEN FOR A WEEK, AND WE WERE DOWN TO NOTHING. AND SO ANYWAY, JAMIE, WE HAD 75 CENTS LEFT. THAT'S A TOTAL AMOUNT. WE DIDN'T HAVE CREDIT CARDS. WE DIDN'T HAVE A CHECKING ACCOUNT. WE HAD 75 CENTS, AND THAT WAS IT. AND JAMIE WANTED TO GO WASH CLOTHES, AND SO SHE HAD THREE QUARTERS. SHE'D BE ABLE TO WASH A LOAD OF CLOTHES AND DRY THEM. AND uh, SO ANYWAY, SHE TOOK THE CLOTHES, PUT THEM IN THE CAR, EVEN THOUGH SHE WENT TO THE APARTMENT COMPLEX WHERE WE WERE, SHE PUT THEM IN THE CAR SO SHE WOULDN'T HAVE TO CARRY THEM OVER THERE, AND SHE LEFT TO GO WASH CLOTHES. AND WHILE SHE WAS GONE, MAN, I WAS PRAYING, AND GOD, WHAT'S WRONG? I'M DOING WHAT YOU TOLD ME TO DO TO THE BEST OF MY UNDERSTANDING, AND WE AREN'T EATING. AND I REMEMBER TELLING THE LORD, I SAID, GOD, I'D GIVE MY RIGHT ARM TO FEED JAMIE. AND I WAS IMPUNING GOD'S CHARACTER, BASICALLY SAYING, GOD, YOU AREN'T PROVIDING OUR NEEDS. I'M BETTER THAN YOU ARE. I, I CARE FOR JAMIE MORE THAN YOU CARE FOR US. AND BOY, WHEN I SAID THAT, THE LORD REBUKED ME, AND THEN HE LED ME TO LUKE CHAPTER 12, VERSE 32, THAT SAYS, FEAR NOT, LITTLE FLOCK, FOR IT'S YOUR FATHER'S GOOD PLEASURE TO GIVE YOU THE KINGDOM. AND GOD, THROUGH THAT SCRIPTURE, JUST SPOKE TO ME AND SAID, HE IS NOT THE ONE THAT IS HINDERING. AT THE TIME, I DIDN'T UNDERSTAND. IT WAS MY OWN STUPIDITY THAT WAS CAUSING THE PROBLEMS. I SHOULD HAVE BEEN OUT WORKING A JOB UNTIL WE GOT A MINISTRY LARGE ENOUGH TO SUPPLY OUR NEEDS. BUT I DIDN'T UNDERSTAND THAT. BUT THE LORD GOT ACROSS TO ME THAT HE WANTED TO SUPPLY OUR NEEDS 
more than I wanted to supply them. And man, when I saw that, see, this is what this parable is supposed to be accomplishing. If you couldn't imagine a friend treating you that rudely and denying you, well, then why do you think that God would deny you and let you sit there and suffer and go without? God loves you more than any person ever has. God loved you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. He loves you more than any human relationship. If you expect people to treat you better than this, why would you think God would love you less? And when I saw this, I repented. And man, I just, I mean, the love of God started flowing through me. And when Jamie got back from washing clothes, I told her, I said, we will eat food today, something besides Fritos and Coke. And so for lunch, we had Fritos and Coke. And for supper, we had nothing because we were tired of Fritos and Cokes. We went to church that night and a guy came up to me and he says, uh, after church, would you come over to our apartment? He lived in the same apartment complex we did. And I thought, man, praise God, maybe this guy's going to feed us something. And so we went over there and we visited with him after church and nothing happened. And so anyway, it was time to go. And so I said, well, we're leaving. And he said, oh, here. And he brought out an entire uh, cardboard box of fish that he had caught. I mean, there must have been dozens of fish in there. And then he said, here. And here's, he gave us some beans, I think, and rice and other things to go with it. And boy, we rushed home. Jamie cooked it. And right before midnight, we ate food that day. And then the next day was my birthday and a woman came over and brought me an entire cardboard box of porterhouse steaks. There must have been 20 or 30 of them in there. We went from eating Fritos and Cokes to eating porterhouse steaks for a month. And it was all because I quit looking at God as someone who is prone not to answer my prayer and that I had to do something to beg him, to manipulate him, to coerce him into supplying my need. And I went into just believing that he's a good God and wanted to meet my needs. I'm telling you, that's what these verses are saying. If you would treat your children better, if they ask for a piece of bread, you won't give them a stone. If they ask for a fish, you won't give them a serpent. If they ask for uh, an egg, you aren't going to give them a scorpion. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to us or give whatever it is that we need? That's what this parable is teaching. This isn't teaching that God is prone not to meet our needs. It's teaching just the opposite, that even if you could find a person who wouldn't treat you right, you just keep at it and He'll give it to you out of nothing, but just sure you pressured Him into it. Well, God, much more, if you ask, you're going to receive. You need to understand that God loves you infinitely more than you could ever imagine. And some of you think, well, yeah, that's okay for you, but you don't understand. Man, I hadn't been living for God. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait until we got our act together. He died for us while we were still sinners. And it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. So if you receive salvation while you were still a sinner. Now that you are born again, you ought to expect God to move in your life much more now. I'm out of time today, but I'm going to be sharing about this all week long, and I encourage you to please check back in, listen to the program. You can go to our website and watch the entire week's programs. I've also got this free booklet here that will summarize this teaching. This is a gift to you, and then we have the book on a better way to pray. We've also got this in audio and then we've got uh, study guides, DVDs, CDs, and USBs. Listen to our announcer and please call or write today. Thank you for watching our program today. And I also want to let you know that God has blessed us. We are bursting at the seams. And we've actually had hundreds of students that wanted to come to our Karis Bible College and they weren't able to find housing. And so we could have a lot more students than what we have. We now have over 1,100 students. And praise God, we finally started building our student dorms. We've got it planned to build dorms for over 1,000 students. We're also going to have to have a place to feed them. We're building a cafeteria that'll seat over 1,000 students. We're building additional auditoriums that'll seat over 1,000 people. 
We're building new classrooms, an athletic center, a hotel and conference center, a performing arts center. We've got big plans. I need to double the number of partners that I've got in order to be able to do this. We've got a place on our website that if you would go to awmi.net slash campus, then you could actually see a artist flyover where you go over the buildings and see inside of them and walk around. And I tell you, it's awesome what we're planning on doing. I believe it's God ordained, but we need people to help us. Pray about it. And if the Lord speaks to you, join with us and become a part of this. We are changing people's lives and they in turn are leaving this place and going out and changing the world. So check it out, awmi.net slash campus. I wanna let you know that we now have a Truth and Liberty live call-in show every weekday and you can tune in from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time and we are gonna be discussing not only spiritual things, but political things, just anything. It's a live call in, you will actually get put on the air and we will interact with you and I believe it's gonna be a blessing to you. So remember that's every weekday from 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. for our Truth and Liberty live call in show. Andrew is offering his booklet, A Better Way to Pray as his free gift to you today. This booklet is available in English or Spanish and is limited to one free booklet per household. This offer is available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, A Better Way to Pray, is available in a book and study guide in either English or Spanish, or you can get this teaching in a newly updated CD or DVD album and as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available when you contact us. Andrew is also offering this teaching as an audiobook on CD, or it can be purchased through audible.com. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software, the Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God. Get Andrew's Living Commentary today for $135. Go to our website at awmc.ca and click on Today's TV Offer under the Store tab to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. I'd like to encourage you to check out our AWM Now stories and also our Inside Story. These are things where we just go behind the scenes and show you things about people in the ministry, about things that the ministry is doing that you'll probably never see on television, and yet it is awesome. God is touching people's lives all around the world. And so you can go to awmi.net and check out the AWM Now stories and also our inside stories. They'd be a blessing to you.